Hello, on this edition of Eco News, we travel 22 miles across the Pacific Ocean from Los Angeles, California to explore Santa Catalina Island, one of the eight Channel Islands. The conservation programs of the Catalina Island Conservancy has worked to save over 60 endemic species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. On our boat trip with the Catalina Express, we have a chance to see some of the coastal and ocean environment. Here at the port of Long Beach, I'm ready to hop on one of Catalina Express's many high-speed vessels to take us on our journey. The company has been transporting visitors and residents for over 30 years from various Southern California locations. Let's go! Get out there and see some great wildlife, but uh, we're glad to have you and Eco News on our Jeep Eco Tour today. So uh, if you're all set to go, let's get on the road. Thank you. Let's hop in. We have finally started our Jeep Eco Tour. And we're going through this charming town of Avalon to get into the wilderness and the natural habitat. And I can't wait to see some of the beautiful plants and animals. Founded in 1972, the nonprofit organization Catalina Island Conservancy has been taking action to save the island's unique flora and fauna. Over 10 years ago, they reintroduced the endangered island fox. They also have a herd of bison, which reflects the ranch history. And they are regularly conducting research and restoration of the island habitats. We are currently on one of the Channel Islands. 
locals in Los Angeles call it Catalina, but it's really Santa Catalina Island, 22 miles long, eight miles across. But the Catalina Island Conservancy actually owns, operates, preserves, protects, researches over 88% of the land. You have over 62 species of plants and animals found no place else in the world, endemic, only to this island? That seems like a lot of flora and fauna that's very special. It is. Yes, absolutely. We have about eight plants endemic to Santa Catalina Island. We have a bunch of mammals. The vast majority of that is actually our invertebrates, though. So quite a few insects out here that are unique to this island and nowhere else in the world. We have many species of lizards on the island, five different species of snakes on the island. We have salamanders, tree frogs. We have all sorts of reptiles, amphibians on the island. So you're doing research about these? How much do we know about all of these plants and animals? That is a field that is constantly ongoing with research. That number fluctuates every year. Just a few years ago, we had over 50 species. Now it's over 60 species. And they're actually currently conducting research to determine if our rattlesnake may in fact be an endemic species. We have a Southern Pacific rattlesnake on Catalina Island that they're showing now not only looks and acts differently, but actually has a stronger venom than the mainland variety of that. The Catalina Island ground squirrel just recently was reclassified and termed an endemic species. The Catalina Island fox is an endemic species. We have two endemic butterflies on the island. Research is necessary and it's constantly going on to try to determine just how many endemic species we have out here because there may be many more that we just haven't identified yet. So we have island symposiums annually where biologists that work on each of the Channel Islands get together and talk about the status of the island's flora and fauna and work together, share management strategies to try to keep the islands in continuity and good health. These islands have been populated by human beings for thousands of years, although tourists coming over are rather new. It used to be the home of the Tongva Indians? Yes, that's true. For as many as somewhere between 9,000 and 14,000 years ago, the Tongva Indians occupied Catalina Island, which they called Pimu, lived on the island, and it actually astounds me. They maintained a population of about 3,500 residents on this island. Today, in the town of Avalon, there are approximately 3,500 residents. So they were able to sustain an equivalent population to modern society, but living off the land, as opposed to the plains and the barges and those resources that we have available to us now. Freshwater was definitely an issue for them. It's an issue for us today. They were very in tune with the land, knew where all the natural springs were, knew how to successfully utilize those resources. So they managed with just the little bit of water that we have here. But the current population has to be very careful about energy and water conservation. Absolutely, yes. So in the 1950s, the Wrigley family built a reservoir in the center of the island called Thompson Reservoir. And that reservoir is why we're able to sustain the population that we do today. But we are very cautious in this town. Many of the toilets utilize salt water. So we try to conserve water in every way possible. We ration actually also. So we're currently in phase one water rationing and we'll go into phase two here soon if it continues to be this dry. Let's talk about some of the more current history. William Wrigley took over sole ownership of the island in 1919, had originally entered an agreement to purchase the island with some partners, and after seeing the island, fell in love and bought it. So he built the world-famous casino, made it the Hollywood glamour era that it was. And then upon his passing, his son, Philip K. Wrigley, took over ownership of the island and established the Conservancy in 1972. He had seen what all these decades of non-native grazing had done to the island and the degradation that was occurring and decided that he wanted to restore it and for it to continue to exist in its natural state. So he deeded 88% of the island, about 42,000 acres, to the Conservancy. You mentioned the casino, but then it became a ballroom, and I remember performing in it back in the late 1960s. Yes, it was. So it's the ballroom on the top floor. It's a movie theater. It's actually the first theater in the country built for both sound and silent film. So a movie theater, and then the bottom story today is the Catalina Island Museum. And I'm looking at some very historic pictures of the ranch, and people were horseback riding. They can still take a horse out? They can't anymore. The island company used to have stables in Avalon and you could go horseback riding, but they've removed those stables now. So the only stables remaining now are in Middle Ranch and each of those horses are privately owned by a resident of Avalon. There are seven marine protected areas across the island, each with kind of a varied scale of protection. Some are no take, some are minimal take. Um, But yes, we do closely guard our marine habitat and shield it from any over-exploitation. We're at one of the special groves that has a number of native plants. I see cactus and also ironwood. Yes, so behind us here is one of the groves of ironwood trees. We discussed earlier, they're a relic species that was once abundant on the mainland, and now this is one of the few places they exist. 
The interesting thing about ironwood trees is it looks like it's multiple trees, but it's actually one root system with all those branches coming up. So what looks like probably about 30 trees behind us is actually just one individual tree. What kind of species of cactus? We have prickly pear cactus here on the island that is native. It is a cactus that was heavily utilized by the native Tongva. They would use the prickly pear fruit called tuna and eat them. And now they're actually a favorite food of the Catalina Island fox. Just have to be careful when I'm hiking. Absolutely. You do not want to stumble into a cactus. So this island is actually 5 million years old. That's when it came out of the water. However, our geology is many hundreds of millions of years old. We formed under the very unique circumstance where the Farallon Plate once existed off the coast of North America. It subducted and slid beneath North America, leaving in its wake this mound of Farallon debris. But just behind the Farallon Plate, the Pacific Plate, which now sits off the coast of North America, slams into North America. And so we have have this kind of conglomerate of North American Pacific Plate and Farallon debris left behind with igneous material and it's really just completely unique geology out here. Is the soil very rocky or is it easy to grow things? It's not too easy to grow things. We don't have a whole lot of topsoil out here. It is pretty rocky. It varies as you move across the island um, as you can see but no it wouldn't be too easy to sustain agriculture out here because it is in the Conservancy's mission to be a responsible steward of the land through a balance of conservation, education, and recreation. We actually encourage people to visit this island to hike and to bike and to camp and to get out there and see it. This is rather unique that an area set aside for nature, for the habitat of plants and animals, is also encouraging people to be in it. Yes. It's not set aside and saying people stay out. Right. Wrigley, when he established the Conservancy, he said, I love this place and I want people to get to it and to see it and experience it. So he actually mandated that the Conservancy make recreation a part of their policy. And it's worked out excellently in that we're so near L.A. So it provides people that live in congested L.A. the opportunity to come to this island and experience true wilderness just 22 miles out to sea. A lot of Californians think that these eucalyptus trees are native, but they really came from Australia. They did. It's true. You see many eucalyptus trees like this blue gum lining what is called Stage Road. It is called Stage Road because it was originally a stagecoach road. Originally, people would ride up and down this road with a horse and buggy, and these eucalyptus trees were put in to hold the road in place and keep the buggies from going off the edge. And of course, now they're using golf carts. Yes, so the golf carts also don't go off the edge. <laughs> Electric. That's more ecological. <laughs> I wish. They're all gas-powered, unfortunately. <laughs> but these were brought in as windbreakers. They were all across the state. They use eucalyptus as windbreakers. They are very quick growing, hardy trees. So they work excellent for that purpose and for holding in a road like this. However, they do have their ecological impact. There's actually a resin, a chemical on the leaves that when they put on the ground, it leaches into the soil and actually changes the chemistry of the soil. So they do have a bit of a negative impact. However, safety is a priority out here with people going up and down this road all day. So we do keep them here to keep this road in place. Let's take a closer look here at the map. And I noticed that there's a very wide spot, but this isthmus is pretty tiny. Yes, so this wide spot from Long Point to China Point here is the island's widest point. It's eight miles across, whereas here when you're looking at the isthmus over in two harbors, we're just a quarter mile across. So pretty narrow here. And this isthmus is actually what saved the Catalina Island fox. When canine distemper was introduced to the island, from a, a raccoon strain of canine distemper. 99% of the foxes on this east end went extinct, whereas this west end, because foxes don't travel between the isthmus too regularly, the west end was preserved, and they were able to capture and do captive breeding with that west end population. So it's actually the geography of the island that saved that species. And I remember coming out about 10 years ago and seeing the release of those foxes. They're doing well? They are doing so well, you can find them anywhere. Uh, after canine distemper came to the island, we got down to fewer than a hundred individuals remaining on the island. We brought them into the captive breeding facility, got up to several hundred, re-released them, and today we have about 1,500 foxes on the island. So they are abundant throughout the island. This St. Catherine's Lace is a native plant, but it's right here on the roadside. Yes, it is a native plant, and it is actually one of Catalina's endemic plants. It is named St. Catherine after Santa Catalina or St. Catherine Island. It is an example of an island giant. If you can believe it, this is actually a buckwheat, which on the mainland is a much smaller plant. But here on Catalina, it grew into this giant plant that reaches up to eight feet tall. So it's much larger than the mainland variety. But if you look at the base of it here, you can see some fennel stalks growing through. Fennel is actually a highly invasive weed on this island that are chirp or 
Catalina Habitat Improvement and Restoration Program works full time to remove from the island. And you use a lot of volunteers to help remove some of those exotics. Absolutely. We depend heavily on volunteer labor. We have groups like AmeriCorps and ACE and the Sierra Club and all these wonderful college groups that come to the island and volunteer their time to help us work to remove other plants like this fennel. I'm looking at some of the trees here in the town. They're imported. Palm trees weren't native to this place. So do you call this coastal sage community of chaparral? We have many different habitat types on the island, chaparral and coastal sage scrub being a dominant habitat type up here. We also have abundant oak woodlands. We have riparian habitats. We have coastal and dune habitats. So a lot of that topography and the geography leads to the diversity of habitat types we have out here. But yes, within Avalon here, you do see many ornamental plants. A threat to most island species is the introduced animal. And I noticed that you have here one of your problems. You have the skeleton of a feral cat. Now, this is the domesticated cat. It is, yes. So it's just a domestic cat that has been released and reproduced in the wild. So you can see here what I have. This is a domestic feral cat skull. But if compared, you can see our endemic Catalina Island fox. They are very similarly sized animals. And in fact, the domestic cat on the island is commonly much larger than the island fox. Island foxes weigh anywhere from four to five pounds and domestic cats get up to nine, 10, 11 pounds. So this is a huge issue for our fox on the island and that they directly compete with them for food resources, as you said, birds, mice, um, but they also directly compete with the fox and we have frequently injuries occurring in foxes from encounters with feral cats. So introduced species are definitely a huge issue out here. One of our largest introduced species issues is mule deer. Mule deer were introduced to Catalina Island in the 1930s for hunting purposes. Now they're still on the island, and the unfortunate thing is that they find many of our endemic and rare species a delicacy. So because these plants evolved on an island without the pressure of a large herbivore, you can see here I have, this is a Catalina Island ground squirrel skull. This is our largest native herbivore on the island, if you can believe that. When you introduce species like deer and bison, and at one point in time we had goats and sheep and pigs, is a huge impact on the vegetation. So deer now are really what's impairing our vegetation. This skeleton that I'm holding of the squirrel only looks like a couple of inches in length. Yes, they're actually considered an island giant though, if you can believe that. They're the descendant of a beachy ground squirrel, which is only a couple inches from head to tail. The Catalina version of that animal, the endemic Catalina one, is actually a couple inches larger. So it's actually, in terms of squirrel, it's quite large. But in terms of these deer and the other non-native herbivores that are introduced to the island, quite small, yes. We're at a revegetation project site and the fence is intentional. It is, yes. This is what we call a deer exclosure fence. There are numerous ones of these across the island. After a fire burned through in 2007, deer were eating some of our most precious and rare vegetation. So fences like these ones were put up to protect particular habitats from deer getting in there and grazing. That's why you see plants like this island mallow and uh, various ceanothus plants growing within this exclosure. Normally, outside the fence line, deer would have eaten them. About how many plants do they reintroduce? They weren't actually planted. Given the opportunity without deer browsing on them, we found that numerous species just came back on their own. We have over 400 native species of plants on this island, so we protect as many of those as we can. I'm also looking at a building where you used to have a radio station. Absolutely. KBRT used to be a radio station that would broadcast from here on the island. They're no longer broadcasting from this facility that you see behind me here, but once upon a time they did. And that's why you see these antennas over in this area too, as those were used for broadcasting purposes. We also see electrical wires and telephone poles. Yes, absolutely. Southern California Edison runs poles across the island to bring electricity all the way from Two Harbors to Middle Ranch back to Avalon, and these are their utility poles that they maintain. And I see some bison over there. Absolutely. That's a small group of our bison herd on the island. A lot of them roam together. You frequently see females and maybe an alpha male together. That's probably what that group is over there. Let's get a closer look. It's pretty big. Yes, they're a large animal. This looks like a male to me over here. And thankfully at the moment, he's quite content grazing. Yes. You want to make sure, though, we don't get any closer. Absolutely. We always encourage people to give them their distance. They are wild animals, so it is smart. They have those horns and they do use them. How much does it weigh? A male like this can weigh about a ton or about a thousand pounds to a ton for a very large animal. We don't feed them. They live off nature. You can see there are lots of grasses here. Most of these grasses are non-native introduced European grasses, but they tend to satisfy the bison quite well. And you can see that he's getting some moisture from that shrub up there.
The bison or the buffalo, what's the difference in the word? Uh, bison is the correct term there, American bison, buffalo. They've kind of become synonymous now, but buffalo is in regards to a species in Africa or Asia who's very closely associated to water. They roam free. They are a wild herd. We try to keep them try being the operative word here out of Avalon and out of two harbors there are two feral animal fences but there's a saying you can make a bison go anywhere it wants to go so if they were determined to get to any of those locations they would they arrived on the island in 1924 for film a movie it was for a long time believed they were filming the vanishing American now they're thinking it's actually a movie called the thundering herd so exactly what film they were brought over for is controversial but we know it was 14 individuals brought in 1924 at one point we got up to over 600 animals well 600 animals on this island is not only quite devastating on the landscape, but the animals were incredibly malnourished. There's just not enough food here to support a herd of that size. The Conservancy entered an agreement with a tribe in South Dakota called the Rosebud Lakota, and we actually rounded up, corralled our bison, put them on a truck and on a barge, and drove many of them back to South Dakota and re-released them in the Great Plains. Because they're the same species, so it was appropriate. Yes, absolutely. You could bring them back, and they integrated into the herd nicely. And actually, even within one year, they gained over 100 pounds. So by being re-released in their native habitat... Having that bountiful food available to them, they bounce back no problem. And we maintain now 150 on the island using contraceptives, if you can believe that. And that's what this needle is. That is. This is a dart. That is what comes out of the dart gun. So it is a once annual, non-hormonal, fully reversible drug that is administered to the females. So you can see I have some tags here. This is a female bison ear tag. This is the male one. You can see it's quite a bit smaller because the females we have to identify once annually and administer that contraceptive to them. You just shoot them with a dart and they cannot get pregnant for one year. So if the herd ever starts to decline below that 150 animals, you simply choose a couple of females one year. You don't administer the contraceptive and the next year they have calves. And this is another kind of tag? Yes, this is another ear tag that goes on all bison. This is one that you can scan a radio scanner over and it'll pop up a unique identify for that animal. So we've done a lot of blood work on our herd to determine the health. And so you can determine exactly when you last saw that animal and what kind of health they were in. <laughs> one of the animals that literally flew in to the island was the eagle. How long has it been here? Why did it disappear? Why did it come back? And am I looking at an eagle egg right here? You are looking at a replica of an eagle egg. Bald eagles historically existed on the Channel Islands. It is their native range. However, in the 1950s, the chemical pesticide DDT was discharged into the California blight here, the channel just off the coast of Long Beach. Huge quantities of this chemical pesticide. It was ingested by fish, which were consumed by eagles, and it biomagnified up the food chain to the point where, where a bald eagle would lay an egg, and that eggshell would be so thin that when she would sit on it to incubate her egg, it would crack. So in the 1950s, bald eagles ceased to exist on the Channel Islands. They went locally extinct out here. But in 1980, the Institute for Wildlife Studies decided to reintroduce bald eagles to Catalina Island. So with the help of the Conservancy, they brought adult eagles to the island and re-released them in hacking towers. Unfortunately, even at that time, the DDT levels were so abundant in the food web that they still were not successfully reproducing in the wild. So what they did is, as soon as a female would lay an egg, a biologist with the Institute for Wildlife Studies would go into the nest, take out the real egg, and put in this replica egg that you see here. The adult eagle would return to the nest, incubate the replica egg, none the wiser to the entire process. They would bring the real egg into a captive breeding facility, incubate and hatch that egg in captivity, and then once that egg had hatched, they would return the chick to the nest, remove the replica egg, and the parent again return to the nest, none the wiser, and raise the chick as their own. Now, thankfully, since 2007, the Institute for Wildlife Studies decided, let's test it, let's see if the chemical has diluted enough that they can successfully reproduce in the wild, selected one nest, and it did successfully reproduce. So now, since 2008, we no longer interfere with any of the nests, and all seven nests on the island are successfully reproducing 100% naturally Over 50 miles of undeveloped coastline, it's one of the largest stretches of undeveloped coastline in the state. So this is one of the places where you can come and see what wild California would look like had it not been developed. Just a 10 minute drive through the island and you easily pass through four different habitat types. So we live in a Mediterranean climate where it is very dry. Catalina only gets about 7 to 15 inches of rainfall per year, and this year has been on the low end of that. It has been very dry. So yes, we have a lot of dormant plants out there indeed. Uh, one of the great things about Catalina, however, is that because we have a maritime layer, we have that fog layer that frequents the island, our plants actually receive quite a bit of moisture still from that fog layer. But yes, even in the summer, you see them looking quite brown, and they look dead, but you're right, they are just dormant. <laughs>
Catalina is beautiful in the springtime. If you want to come here and hike and bike, I absolutely recommend coming in the spring. You have the wildflowers, the Indian paintbrush, and the lupin, and the hillsides just come alive with color in the spring. It's beautiful. Just within the Conservancy, we have a wildlife department, we have our plant department, and we have actually a native plant nursery in Middle Ranch, which is our conservation headquarters. They propagate millions of seeds and grow them for restoration purposes and also to keep an inventory of our plant bank in there to make sure that we maintain the genetics of those plants. One of the experiences I have yet to do, because when I was doing competitive marathoning, it didn't exist, is the Catalina Marathon. It's considered one of the hardest in the United States because you have some hills. Now, how high is the elevation? Because right now we're at sea level. Yes, so we are at sea level and our highest peak is just over 2,100 feet. And the marathon pretty much takes you from sea level to 2,100 feet. So this island does not make it easy. And for those who aren't as athletic, I saw at the port, both paddle boating, kayaking, sailing, swimming at the beach. Yes, so there's definitely the marine recreation, and then there are other hiking trails in town, like our Garden of the Sky hike is a great hiking trail that you could do in in flip-flops, really. It's pretty moderate, it's pretty easy ascent, and plus you get out into the wilderness pretty simply. So you do not have to be an expert athlete to experience Catalina's Wildlands. The Conservancy manages and maintains over 200 miles of roads on the island. Most of those are dirt roads. Many hundreds of miles of hiking trail also. So commonly people come to the island and rent a golf cart and think, I'm going to see the whole island. Little do they know, Avalon is only a very small piece of what this island has to offer. We look forward to returning to Catalina Island in Southern California to see more of the unique plants and animals and to participate in some of the many special activities on the island. I'd like to thank the Catalina Island Conservancy for the great Jeep Eco Tour. On behalf of Eco News and Educational Communications, our nonprofit organization, I'm Nancy Perlman wishing you a natural, unspoiled environment. <laughs>